Hello everyone and welcome back to Lunch with a Dietitian. Um, I'm Cara Miller, your campus dietitian. Thank you for those who are joining us today. Um, the session is being recorded, so if you know of anyone who is unable to attend or if you need to jump off a little bit early, that's no problem. Um, if you go over into your chat, um, I have listed the information for this meeting, so I've attached a couple of resources. I've um, put in the PDF to the slides. Um, that also helps if we have any technical difficulties along the way, but you're welcome to have those slides. I know some people like to look back at the information later. Um, and my contact information is there. So as I'm going along, um, I don't have access to the chat. So if you don't mind saving the questions until the end or type them in the chat as we go along and I'll get to them at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> my name is Cara, as mentioned. And the session is being recorded. I know many of the universities do offer wellness credit or some insurance benefits for this class. So if you're interested in that and you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can get you in touch with the contact at your university. Typically that is through the HR department, but I'm happy to get you connected. My email is at the bottom, my phone number as well. So reach out anytime. Um, we're going to just jump right into this. This topic today is about an introduction to intuitive eating, and I realize that many individuals probably started on some kind of something <laughs> during the new year, and there's a reason you're on the call or interested in this topic, um, is that typically within the first couple of weeks of trying a diet or trying something new, it's very hard to make it a reality or something that sets in as a habit, um, but also a lot of them are unrealistic and not lifelong solutions. And so you're not alone in that, and that does not mean that you failed. It means that diets don't work. Um, over the last couple of years, especially with COVID, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of thought-provoking um, just questions to myself. Uh, my history is that for after my clinical rotations, I actually had a job inpatient as a dietitian, and then I worked for almost five years doing weight management, and I saw the cycles. I saw things come through. Um, I also had a dad who struggled with weight my whole life, um, and so there's lots of different questions there and struggles and fam other family members that kind of ride this roller coaster of I'm being good or now I'm off track or you do the very best you can and you have so much willpower and it just doesn't work anymore. A lot of this is related to weight, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about reducing inflammation to help with your arthritis. Sometimes it's about um, maybe trying to lower your blood pressure. There's a lot of things that kind of go into if you're able to stick to it or not. And so um, I think a lot of people think of a dietitian as kind of the food police or the right or wrong. I know I've even had coworkers come up like, oh, car, I don't look, I'm eating a brownie. I'm like, oh, come on, really? Like, I love all foods too. So I do believe that all foods can fit. And just a couple of statistics is that 95% of all dieters regain their lost weight within one to five years. Um, Sometimes it's even sooner. Things like the ketogenic diet or some of even the intermittent fasting that's going on, it really creates such a deficit that it comes back even quicker. Um, of those dieters, 35%, so roughly one in three, um, of normal dieters progress into pathological dieting. So you've tried something once before, it didn't work, you try it again, you try something else, you're on constantly looking for the next thing. How do I do this? What's the next thing I should try? And then of those um, frequent dieters, I would say, um, up to 25% develop some form of disordered eating. And I know that's a scary word. I work with a lot of college students. Um, I have worked a lot with adults in the past. And a lot of individuals are constantly saying, you know, this food is good. This food is bad. I'm being good. I'm being bad. Um, maybe it is some of this frequent dieting or food fears even. Oh, I don't know if I should eat that. Isn't that not good for me? Um, and so a lot of that mentality is a form of disordered eating. And that may not be a full on eating disorder, but um, it's influencing your thoughts. It's creating some negative mentality, often tied with guilt or shame by just eating a normal food, right? Like you have a bowl of ice cream and you're like, I feel so guilty, it's just ice cream. But um, our society has kind of ingrained this negativity with certain foods. Um, and depending on the fad diet you're choosing or the rules you're trying to follow, um, it can be a very slippery slope. 
So intuitive eating is considered anti-diet. And I think that there's a lot of stigma around that. There's a lot of things in the media. Everyone is trying to do some form of intuitive eating. It kind of caught on during COVID or maybe a little bit before, um, but it really got traction over the last couple of years. And even in the media, throw you like watch something on TV, there's a new celebrity, they're doing anti-diet ketogenic. And I'm like, what is that? That doesn't even make sense. So just kind of be careful when um, somebody like celebrity or something is kind of pushing an anti-diet message. Anti-diet is not anti-weight loss. There are many individuals who go into an anti-diet approach through intuitive eating and weight loss is a result, but that is not the goal. Um, anti-nutrition. So just because we call it anti-diet doesn't mean you're just going to be eating, you know, all cookies and sodas and whatever all the time for the rest of your life. There may be a portion of that. There may be a season of that, but it's not anti-nutrition. It's not anti-fruits and vegetables, whole grains, etc. cetera. Um, it's not anti-health. There are plenty of reasons why um, intuitive eating is really helps benefit health. Um, an anti-diet doesn't mean that we don't take health conditions or diagnoses into consideration. Um, it's also not the person anti-diet, uh, person who diets. So like if you have a history of dieting, that doesn't mean that you can't try an anti-diet moving forward. Um, there's always room for change. We're always adapting. And I think that's really, really wonderful. So it is anti-diet culture um, and oppression. So some of that like feeling shameful whenever you eat something, it is against that. And um, I think that you can find anti-dieting very freeing um, and intuitive eating kind of offers a few steps to do that. So what the heck is intuitive eating anyways? I know it's something like mindful and you have to pay attention, but what is this? Um, intuitive eating, according to Evelyn Triboli, she and Elise Risch wrote this book in 1995. They were both diet, they are both dietitians. They worked ma weight management also, actually have a very similar story to me, and saw frequent flyers, people coming back, um, doctors asking like, oh, well, if you just lose 20 pounds, you know, <clears throat> you'll be able to get pregnant. If you just lose 20 pounds, your diabetes will go away. If you just lose 20 pounds, and they always put it to a weight and a number, but they never looked at the whole individual. They never looked at what that drastic weight loss might be doing or how they're getting there. And is it sustainable? And how is it affecting their stress and mental health? And are they able to participate in social events? Um, it was all about the weight and the number on the scale. And that's what this is not about. Um, it's the opposite of that. So intuitive eating, is a self-care eating framework, just a framework. It's not rules. It's like a guide, um, which integrates instinct. So like when we're growing up, we have basic instincts as humans, um, takes into consideration emotion um, and rational thought. So again, like I mentioned, this was by the two dietitians. Evelyn Triboli gets most of the credit. I think it's because she's kind of gone further into um, posting a website. She hosts a lot of training sessions. She has a book and also a workbook. We'll talk about the resources towards the end. So we'll go through the 10 steps of intuitive eating, um, and then I'll talk about a bunch of different resources available to you. So I think you'll find it very helpful. Um, intuitive eating is weight inclusive, uh, evidence-based model of validating assessment scale over, for over like 100 studies. So it just time and time again shows that it works and it isn't based on a number on a scale. Um, it really follows closely to the, you may have heard of health at every size or haze, H-A-E-S, um, really that you can be healthy at any size. And that doesn't mean that everyone is healthy at every size, but um, just because you're in a small body doesn't mean you're healthy. And just because you're in a big body doesn't mean that you're unhealthy. It has nothing to do with it. It's just a size of your body. So intuitive eating basics. We're going to go through these kind of 10 mentalities, these 10 kind of steps, and then I'll go through a bunch of resources at the end because I really want to make it practical to you. So we'll go through a few examples in each one, and you may find that something resonates with you more than others. Um, but the other thing that this intuitive eating guide kind of goes through is that really it probably should be done in order. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't bounce around sometimes or you might be working on more than one at a time, but really kind of starting with number one and then working your way through. Um, you can't focus on moving and honoring your health if you don't reject the diet mentality. So we'll kind of walk through those steps.
So the first one is rejecting diet mentality. Most of us are aware of it, whether we like it or not, or whether we acknowledge it or not. Um, diet culture has many different lies that we see all the time. I just pulled this Instagram post, um, the diet culture lies that sugar is addictive. That's not true. Um, that if you weigh less, you're healthier. That's also not true. Um, if you eat what you want, you'll only eat treat foods or junk foods. Or if you only let me eat what I want, I'm only going to eat donuts or I'm only going to eat chips. That's not true. Um, if you eat less, you'll lose weight. That's also not true. And I saw that over and over in the hospital. We would put people on like an 800 calorie diet and they would eventually plateau because your body just says like, okay, we don't have any energy. I'm just going to hang out here. I don't know when you're going to feed me again. So it is really important to um, get rid of this diet mentality. And we'll talk about some of the next steps too. The more you exercise, the healthier you will be. That's also not necessarily true, right? We need to take into account what is the mentality behind it? How frequent is it? Are you fueling for your exercise? Are you under fueling? I talk about this a lot with our athletes or very active individuals. Um, and even a quick search on Netflix shows you all the hot trends. What is health? It has a big hamburger or whatever. It has all the like jelly beans and stuff on it. Some of you may have heard of Game Changers. That's a push to get vegans, um, athletes to follow a vegan diet. And a lot of these, remember, this goes back to like college communication studies 101 or whatever, that if it's a documentary, it is a persuasive message. It's supposed to persuade you of something. It's not always straight information so that you can come to your own conclusion. So just keep that in mind whenever you're watching some of these documentaries. Um, Diet culture has a lot of things. Christy Harrison is a wonderful dietitian. She's actually called the anti-diet dietitian. Um, and her definition is that diet culture is the life thief. It steals joy, life, money, time, and well-being. Um, and so you can see that it may impact, oh, can't speak very well. It may impact your um, social engagements. So you may find that you don't go out to eat with others because you're afraid what they're going to say. Or um, you might isolate because you feel like you have to restrict what you're eating. And so um, if you were to go out to eat, it wouldn't make that. Like, I, example, um, if a friend says, oh, let's go out for ice cream, and you're like, no, I'm following this diet. I, I really shouldn't or I really can't, right? It can be very isolating. Um, the restriction pendulum. So most people experience something like you restrict, you restrict, you don't eat, you, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. And then you're like, oh, forget it. Boom. And you fling the other way and you just eat whatever you feel out of control. Then that's followed by guilt and shame. And then you're like, no, tomorrow I can do this. I'm going to be good. I can do this and restrict, restrict, restrict. And it swings right back and forth, back and forth. And you're not seeing the results you want. It's very hard to stay motivated. You're constantly feeling shameful or upset about body image, about your food choices. It can be very sad. Um, lots of food rules and food fears. So this too goes back to like, you know, what is the diet? Oh, ketogenic, only 50 grams of carbs and you can't eat this and you can't eat this, right? Like lots of rules. And if you don't do them, you're breaking the rules. Um, and that's really not what our bodies were meant to do either. Or food fears, like, oh my gosh, I'm afraid if I eat, I had a student in the other day, oh my gosh, I'm afraid if I eat a banana, I'm going to get fat. And I was like, what does that mean to you? Um, and just kind of exploring more of those lies that we've been told over the years and realizing that they can be debunked. Um, and then also feelings of guilt. We talked about that a little bit that when you're isolated when you feel like you haven't been successful which what is success anyway um you can feel really guilty about it you can feel really like how come i don't have more willpower how come i just can't do this um number two kind of moving out of that is so when we go back to this anti-diet it really is um reject the diet mentality say like this is a lie they are not telling me the truth this is not good for my body one size doesn't fits all um ketogenic isn't right for everyone it may not be right for me let me follow up with my doctor um if you're constantly looking even though you're like oh i'm anti-diet but you're like maybe this next thing will be the thing that does it you're still kind of falling into that diet culture and you won't fully embrace the um, intuitive eating concept. Number two is honoring your hunger. 
And this is tricky. A lot of times we get busy. We don't pay attention if we're hungry or not. We wonder why we're so angry and snippy with coworkers. It turns out we're just hungry. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Um, if I get like kind of cranky, it's like, Cara, get a snack. Um, but I do think it's important to look at this as a hunger scale. And we've lost touch with this. When you're a baby, you cry when you're hungry, you're fed, you're satisfied. Um, but we lose touch with that over the years. You know, people like, oh, just wait a little bit, or you're not hungry, or eat till you're overly stuffed. Um, some of these concepts over overlap but honor your hunger so if you're feeling like you're at a four or a three you definitely want to eat something um, you don't want to wait till you're at a one or a two and you're totally starving and then you don't have any willpower and you're super hungry and so you eat too fast in a manner that you're not mindful you can't pay attention to how the food tastes or your social environments um, you're just disconnected from the food experience so making sure that you kind of pay attention as you go so that you can honor your hunger. Um, this can help to prevent uncontrolled or mindless eating or overindulging. So what we find again too is kind of back to that pendulum where when you overly restrict or you're overly hungry, then you overeat. And I see this a lot when people either skip breakfast, they're like, well, I'm not really hungry in the morning, but then you get to the evening and they can't stop eating. Um, and it's one of those things where maybe if you just shifted a little so that you weren't so hungry come lunch and then you're adapting like, oh, I'll be good. I'm not going to have it. I'll just wait to have a snack till I get home. And then you wait to have dinner until six or seven o'clock because work gets busy and then you're starving and then you overeat and then comes the guilt and the shame and all the things. So honoring your hunger right at the get-go can help you from overindulging or mindless eating later in the day or even later in the week. Make peace with food. This is a hard one we've been told over and over that food is good, food is bad, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Remember that food has no moral value. Um, a donut is no different than an apple in our moral aspect, right? Like one is not good. If you were stuck on a deserted island and you only had apples, that would not be good. Um, just like if you were stuck and you only had donuts, that would also not be good. Um, so this like should have this, shouldn't have that, can't have this, can't have that. Um, that's not a peace of mind. And so when you have this kind of calm peace of mind, you're able to think through your food choices really well. There isn't like, oh, I can't have that or I can only have one bite only. Why? Why only one bite? Actually, if you tell yourself, um, I think I could have that whole cake if I wanted, uh, there would be some process there, right? Because we're not used to that. But over time, if you be kind to yourself and give yourself some patience, you'll find like, oh, I could eat the whole cake if I want to, but let me just see how I feel. And after a couple bites, you might say, mm, I don't really like it, or mm, I think I'm feeling full, or you know what, that extra piece does sound really good. And you're able to kind of make peace with food so it doesn't have that moral value to it. Um, and that then doesn't lead to those binges. When you have a lot of people say, oh, I just crave sugar all the time. It actually might be because you're trying to restrict it too much. I know that sounds really crazy. You may need, you know, there's ways to get fruit too, but if it's from candy, that's okay sometimes. Um, but yes, you can also get sugars from our carbohydrate sources or from our fruit sources. So having a balanced diet is really important with that, but don't feel bad if you want a piece of cake for a birthday or something like that. Um, last supper mentality. So this is like, okay, tonight I'm going to eat the rest of the ice cream so that it's gone tomorrow. I don't have to worry about it, right? It's that last supper, like this is the last time I'm ever going to have this. So I'm just going to overeat it. So you can see how this could lead to overeating this like kind of yo-yo cycle of overeating. So that's why sometimes in some instances, not always, when you take an anti-diet approach and you're really mindful with your food and you allow yourself to have what you want when you want, um, you actually start craving health, considered healthy foods. You may also cut back on some of your portions over time because you're allowing yourself to have the foods so that doesn't result in these binges or these like pendulum swings. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind if you can make, make peace with food and realize that there is no good or bad. Um, and here we come back to that food or bad. There's no good or bad. There's no um, food police. Challenge the food police. Those people that say, you know, why are you having that? Isn't that bad? say something. If you don't say something, at least say something in your head. There's always going to be people commenting. There's always going to be people making judgment, but you have to kind of find peace with yourself and be able to set some boundaries. That's outside of my scope. I deal with the food stuff, but I'm a big fan of counselors. So if you have someone in your life who is 
um, challenging perhaps, keeps asking questions or over assuming like, oh, I, you know, why are you eating that? Isn't that like what your husband, this portion your husband should eat? Like, or whatever the case may be. Um, that's someone where a boundary might be needed um, and realizing that there are no good or bad foods. You can just have them when you want them. And also nutrition is super important. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But if you're looking at the food police, there's no good or bad. It's okay to eat the donut. You don't have to feel guilty. It shouldn't result in this shame guilt spiral. Can you imagine what would happen? I like have been on this journey for a few years, just like kind of thinking about my mindset, but can you imagine how much more joyful food would be if you ate something that you really enjoyed and you didn't feel guilty after you did it? It wasn't like, oh gosh, I shouldn't have done that. Or, oh gosh, I'll start next week and I won't have it again. Like you just get to enjoy it. It's like so freeing. Um, discover the satisfaction factor. What does this mean? Well, there's a lot of ways that food can be satisfying. It can be delicious. It can be savory. It can be sweet. It can also be satisfying to eat with friends and not be so isolated. Um, and you get to decide when you've had enough. This is a big one for me. Um, when I started looking at intuitive eating, it's really the question of, do you trust yourself? Do you trust yourself with food? And that's like a big question. Um, do you trust yourself with other things? Um, because when we kind of get back to the basics of saying, you know what, here's my body, here's what it's telling me. I'm able to listen to my body so your body doesn't have to cry out in shouts and screams. Again, kind of going back to like these little baby concepts. I have two little kids, so it wasn't long ago that I had a baby. Um, and they give you like, mm, mm like little whimpers, right? If they're hungry or whatever. And if you're attuned to that and you know what their need is, you're able to honor it really quickly. They feel satisfied and they're not as fussy. But if you let them get starving Marvin, they are going to scream their brains out. And that's kind of what our body does. It's like, do we even trust our body anymore? Or do we trust social media? Or do we trust the news reporter more than we trust ourselves. Um, and I do think it's important to take science into consideration, but there's so much skewed information out there. Sometimes we just need to kind of get back to basics. Feel your fullness. This is a big one. We're so rushed. We just don't even take the time to feel anything, let alone fullness. Um, we'll talk about emotions on the next couple of slides. So trust yourself. Again, getting back to that concept of are you listening to your body? Do you know what it needs? Do you have tension in your neck? You know, is it because you need to stretch? Is it because right now I'm carrying too heavy of a backpack? Like, what is it? Do we Are we paying even attention to understand? So that plays into our fullness also. Um, check in with yourself. When you're eating a meal, check in with yourself every few minutes. Maybe it's setting an alarm just to kind of get back on track, but this does not mean that after 10 minutes of eating, you have to stop. It's just a check-in. There's nothing good or bad. You're not being good if you decide to continue eating. You're not being bad if you decide to stop or continue eating. It doesn't, it's not good or bad. It's just checking in. Um, if any of you have done yoga, it's the same thing, right? Like um, we're doing this move, but if it doesn't feel good to you, you know, change the position. Here's a modification. So it's just staying in tune with your body. Mindful eating. This could be its own concept. So we're talking about intuitive eating and a lot of times they overlap with mindfulness. But if you've done mindful practices, you realize that you just want to be here and now. So if you're watching TV or even reading a book or scrolling on your phone during mealtimes, you're not going to be as attuned to your fullness or hunger cues or be able to taste your food. I did this experiment once with Doritos. I used to eat, like, I loved Doritos, okay? And so we would sit down and I like was, okay, this one day I'm just gonna eat a Dorito and see how it goes. So I tried a Dorito and like nothing else going on. Very quiet, calm, I was able to be really present. I was like, I don't even like these things. <laughs> so you just sometimes, you know, maybe you love it more than you thought. But for me in this instance, I just didn't even care for it. Um, and since I think I've had a couple Doritos, you know, just cause you know, it was a social thing to do or whatever, but you know, if I didn't want another one, that was fine. So just kind of do that experiment. How, how do you chew or do you chew like three times and then swallow? You're not even tasting your food. Um, is your food crunchy? Is it savory? Is it sweet? Is it mushy? Is it slimy? Like there's textures, there's flavors. Just fully experience your food and that will help you to slow down so you can better identify your fullness cues um, and you can be really present. So if you are distracted with a TV or something, you can often eat more than you think and then afterward you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so full. How did I even get here? And that's why, because you weren't paying attention. 
Um, it happens to all of us, but it is one of those things too. When it happens, this is another instance. Don't pass judgment. Um, you know what? I overate. Dang it. That was unfortunate. Next time, I'll try to be more mindful. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Why am I doing this? Here I go again, right? Spin your thoughts the other direction. Um, and take a break. So if you need to step away from your food, sometimes I know that family dinners, I know when I, you get the whole family together, not even just your immediate family, there's just tension. Maybe Thanksgiving dinner or something like that, any of these big holidays, and you just feel stressed. And so if you feel stressed, you can end up overeating. We'll talk about emotion, but sometimes you just need to take a step away and come back to it. Cope with your emotions. So food can be a part of your emotions. Maybe you want to bake a cake. Maybe you feel like doing something, but it shouldn't be your only emotion and or only way to cope with your emotion. And it shouldn't be um, uh, to go numb. Some people overeat, so they feel numb. They just kind of do this as like a zombie. Like this is my routine. I feel like this is, you know, what happens. So just kind of think outside the box. And again, some contemplation, some mindful practices can be really helpful. If you're angry, maybe kickboxing, maybe go for a walk. Maybe you want to journal. Maybe you want to scream into a pillow. I don't know whatever it is, but don't not feel the emotion. Um, maybe sadness. Again, talk with a friend. Cry. I mean, sometimes we just need to take a long shower and sob our brains out, whatever it is, just to kind of release that pressure. Because when that cycle builds up inside you, whether it's stress or sadness or whatever, if we don't acknowledge the emotion, we hold it somewhere. And so we can get tension in our neck. We can get a belly ache. We can get a headache. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can happen when we hold on to our emotions. Some people say, I eat out of boredom. Well, do something. Maybe you want to take a class. Maybe you want to read a book. Maybe you want to call a friend. Maybe you want to go for a walk. Um, whatever, whatever helps you to not be bored. Um, loneliness, you can get together with a friend again. Maybe you want to write a letter to somebody. People love getting letters. Um, anything just to help you connect with someone. And sometimes scrolling on a screen feels like you're connected, but you're really not. So um, make sure that it's intentional. Make sure that you're reaching out if you need something. Um, and the other one down here, we've got reward. I think at the end of the day, some of these people are like, I did it. <laughs> Maybe it's not even a happy reward, but thank goodness I made it through the day, right? Um, and you can finish with a glass of wine. You could do your nails. You could do a lot of different things, but um, just kind of reward yourself instead of zombieing out on the couch with a bag of chips or eating a bowl, two bowls of three bowls of four bowls of cereal. You know, try to be present with those emotions and be able to feel them. Um, respect your body. This is a big one. I put on the Cinderella shoe because we all know that part where the ugly stepsister puts on the shoe and she's like, look, it fits, it fits. And you're like, it doesn't fit. But we do that with our clothes all the time. Just like, I really want to fit in blank size and this used to fit me. So I'll just squeeze into it or like, I'll just put on this undershirt so I can fit into it. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're doing the same thing as this sister. Like just squeeze it in. I'll fit. I'll get it to fit. Look, it fits. It fits. I mean, it's not comfortable. So if we can be realistic about our body size and our shape, we can get things that are really flattering. We can get things that boost our confidence. Don't hide. Be proud of who you are. Um, we're all different for a reason, and that's important. If you had um, a big shoe size, like size 10, you wouldn't try to squeeze it into a size 6. You just wouldn't. You say, I'm going to buy a shoe that fits. Otherwise, it's going to hurt. It's not going to feel good. I'm not going to be able to walk very well. Well, the same is true with other things. Find things that fit your body and make you feel good. Maybe it's doing your hair because it makes you feel good, not because you want to look thinner doing it. Um, lots of different things to consider. And then be kind to yourself. Um, there's one thing we're doing right now at the universities at the end of the month for eating disorder awareness. We're going to cover a lot of the mirrors at the university with positive thoughts. So write on your mirror. If you got a dry erase marker, write on your me or you got some sticky notes put those there um, if you tend to do body checking like looking in mirrors or looking in windows something like that kind of frequently looking like do I look okay like put some notes up there give yourself some positive vibes movement feel the difference so move to move don't move to exercise don't move to burn calories and this is a big one do something that you feel powerful and strong doing something that gives you energy helps you feel brave or strong or solid um maybe it's strength training maybe it's a walk maybe it's yoga i have um one 
person I'm working with right now and they're like, I just love hit exercises like those classes because I get to see my friends and we just laugh. And I was like, that's what you should do. You know, don't pound around on the treadmill facing the wall in your basement just to burn a few calories. Do something you enjoy. Do something that makes you feel good. Um, do something with friends. Do something that helps to improve your balance. Maybe it's something that helps you de-stress at the end of the way day. There's lots of ways to move and if you're doing it for the right reasons, you'll actually see bigger health effects. Um, when you're less stressed and you're able to just move your body, um, you have a lot more positive effects than just, I'm going to do uh, 20 minutes on a treadmill, ready, go. Um, that doesn't always accomplish the goal. And lastly, honor your health. We talked about this one and the other ones come first, but um, when you're able to kind of doing that gentle nutrition based on your health uh, concerns or your diagnosis, making sure that you do follow up with a doctor, but there are a lot of doctors who are anti-diet as well, and you just got to find them. So if you specifically have a doctor that immediately puts you on the scale, immediately comments on your weight, don't let them bog you down. Um, there are plenty of physicians out there that are really body positive um, and anti-diet, and so those are the ones you want to be looking for. Ask dietitian if you need some help i'm happy to help uh, as much as i can i'm also going to give you another dietitian resource here in just a minute um add things instead of avoiding them so instead of saying oh i can't have that or i can't have that or i shouldn't do this or i shouldn't do that maybe say i'm going to add more color to my plate today or i'm going to add a glass of water today it's not as limiting as restricting it just adds some positive um, but yes, you can get through health and gentle nutrition all at the same time. And what I found, even when you allow yourself to have things, sometimes you actually might say, I really want some carrot sticks right now. I know it seems crazy, but you will. So eventually when you put all the food rules aside and all foods are included, um, you'll find actually that sometimes you are craving those like what are considered healthy options as well. So next steps, there might be some homework um, if you want. If you liked any concept today, something stood out to you, I have a couple worksheets here that I can email. I have my email address at the end. Um, I can email that to you, um, but I've also listed information on workbooks and books. Maybe you want to register for a class. I put Jill Merkel's contact information here. She's actually the dietitian for the Titans, but she does a lot with intuitive eating and she's wonderful. I've met with her many times. We're friends, um, and so I highly recommend her class. She has an intuitive eating class that's run every spring. I think it's six or eight weeks um, and she's lovely. So her website is also really helpful. I listed that there, um, but I'm going to escape just for a second and show you one of these um, workbook pages from the intuitive eating book. So this one is just talking about um, how has dieting interfered with your life and just checking them off weight gain, metabolism struggles, um, excessive carb cravings, blood sugar swings, disconnect from your hunger cues, right? A lot of people could check off almost all of these. You think you're not impacted by diet, but you are. Um, social symptoms. I eat differently when, it, when I'm with others. I compare my food to others. I worry about what others might think about what I'm eating. Like check, 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 right? A lot of these are common for many, many people. Um, I worry about my eating. I I have strict rules about what I'm eating. So these are kind of like the psychology, the good and the bad foods, um, behavioral systems. If I break a rule, I eat more like, like, oh, well, I broke my rule today. Might as well finish off the day with a bang, right? Some of those kinds of things. Um, I'll rotate this around. So self care, um, assessment, you can kind of go through these and just see, you know, are you taking care of yourself or not? Let's see what else I've got on here. There's a few more examples, positive behaviors, getting to know your hunger cues. This one's really interesting if you have never really done that before. Um, making peace with food, that's a good one. I have one more on here that I thought was interesting. I want to go over. Sorry to flip it around. Um, knowing your fullness. So write the time and date, what you ate, the fullness, how long is it after? So has it been 30 minutes since you ate, an hour since you ate, and how full are you? It kind of gives you a feel for if you're overeating. Um, and here's another fullness scale. What was your hunger when you started? What is the fullness when you stop? How do you feel? Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? Um, and, and then you can write down a little bit more about the details too, and then finding someone to go over those with, like a dietitian. I'm happy to review them with you, and we can see some trends. Um, this is just a practice for how to taste. Write down your meal. What is it? What do you see? What does it smell like? What is it? What's the touch? Any sounds that it makes? Is it crunching? Is it, you know, scraping on your plate? What do you notice? What is the taste? Mouthfeel, just to get you to slow down a little bit. 
Um, and then knowing the physical sensation of your emotions. This is a big one, super eye opening. Like I mentioned with anger, maybe you feel tension. Maybe you feel your jaw clench up. And so you could note that somewhere on here um, and just kind of getting to know the different sensations so that when you feel a twinge there, yes, you could have slept wrong, but is it something else going on? Um, so hopefully these are interesting to you and I'm happy to share them. Just just shoot me an email. OK, <clears throat> and then some books are here that's why i give you the powerpoint slides because i wanted you to have all of these resources so here's the books um intuitive e eating by evelyn triboli and this is the workbook that those sheets came from but i'm happy to share you a few of those sheets um anti-diet by christy harrison is good body respect also uh lindo she used to be linda she's changed to lindo um and she also does uh, health at every size and then fearing the black body. That's an interesting one of just kind of how we got to where we are in America with kind of the anti diet. Why do we fear being big in a big body? Some interesting podcasts. Um, Christy Harrison, you see her name all over the place. She's got a great podcast. Um, body image with Brie, fit for a queen if you're more of an active individual. Lots of good ones there. Instagram accounts. I'm happy to fill my Instagram with lots of body positivity, lots of anti-diet messages. Some of them are really funny. So if you have an Instagram account, I highly recommend following these gals and guys. Um, and I think they're really good resources. They're always posting some really positive things. Murray Nutrition, she's a dietitian. Emily Murray, she's right here in Nashville. She's really sweet girl and she does a lot of anti-diet work as well. So I'm going to hop off of here and get to our questions, but um, thank you all for joining me. I will be back again next uh, month, March 2nd at the same time, same calendar link. I haven't changed it so everyone can get back to the session. Um, I haven't finalized the topic yet, so if you have topic suggestions, send them my way. Um, I think I'll probably do something on food prep or meal prep, something like that kind of for a more convenience, helping you navigate your options and cooking at home. So thank you all for joining me. I'm going to hop off of here and take some questions. Let's see. Love Christy Harrison. Me too. Oh, I was going to recommend if you have a long drive to work, um, the intuitive eating book by Evelyn Triboli and also anti diet by Christy Harrison are excellent audiobooks. Um, they're great. They're very engaging. They've got good people <laughs> reading them. I think they're good. I think Christy reads her own, um, but I think that they're really, really helpful. So those are great, great resources. Even if you're traveling, even if you're in the car, listen to them on your way back and forth to work and you'll be like excited about what's to come and you'll be really empowered. I think it's sometimes just nice to know I'm not alone in this. I've got a lot of people that are going through similar things um, and there's a next step. There's some options available to me so I don't have to continue this crazy cycle over and over and over. Um, the Hershey experiment. Yes, so that's a great one, Jamie. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, there is a little tasting. If you're interested in that as well, I'm happy to share it. Um, but you, if you're doing a taste experiment, you can easily, um, I'm gonna try to move this so you all can see my hand. Oh, I can't get it. Um, to taste uh, a taste test. So you, what you do is again, calm environment. You take a couple chocolate chips or a Hershey kiss. What is the texture? How does it feel when it melts? Do you like how it coats your tongue? What are the feelings that it evokes? Sometimes it evokes memories. And that's really interesting too, because smell and taste are really tied in our map to our memories. And so some things evoke really positive memories, some negative without us even paying attention. So again, it takes some of that mindful practice to kind of go through the process to understand um, our feelings and our emotions and our taste and our smell um, and also realizing that just because you don't like a texture is fine. You can actually appreciate it for what it is like. Wow, that's really slimy. I don't that's not my favorite, but it slimy. <laughs> um, and so some of those things uh, become less like, oh, I hate that and more like, well, it wouldn't be my choice, but I understand it kind of so. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to post in case people came in late and maybe didn't have access. I'm posting um, just the summary again. So if you want a copy of the slides, my email address is there. Um, the YouTube channel again, if you know anyone who had to leave early or someone else, you might think find this topic intriguing. They can listen to the recording. I may not get it posted today, but it should be up tomorrow. Um, and then the intuitive eating website, Jill Merkel's website. So hopefully you have a lot of resources available to you. 
Does anyone else have any questions? Well, thank you for tuning in today. If you're further north, I hope you stay safe away from the ice that's to be coming. Um, and for those closer to Nashville and south, um, stay dry in the rain and have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.